Today I'm joined by Mike Volpe, CEO of Lola.com. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm pumped to be here. So I want to start off with a, more of a kind of personal question. Um, is that I think in some of the past interviews or readings that I've come across, it sounds like your grandfather is a very important figure in your life. Can you tell us a little bit more about him? Yeah, I just, um, <clears throat> I found his just story really inspiring. He, um, so his parents moved here to the U.S. from Italy. Uh, he was the youngest of his whole family, and he was the only one born here. Everyone else was born uh, previously in Italy. And obviously, new immigrants grew up in a house that originally didn't have uh, a bathroom. There's sort of like an outhouse in the back. And, um, you know, had to, had to work his way up and sort of make a lot of connections and, um, you know, wasn't originally going to go to college. And then somebody sort of, he made basically the right connection with the right person who also saw that he had played some football and they said, oh, I know this college and maybe you could go there and maybe play football there. And just sort of had, a, you know, both, I think, uh, lucky circumstances and just a lot of hard work over the years um, and ended up becoming um, a teacher and a guidance counselor at a couple different high schools and just uh, doing a whole bunch of things. And I remember spending a lot of time with him and actually doing a report for school where we had to interview one of our relatives. Um, and I just was really inspired, you know, through a story. Obviously, he grew up through the Great Depression in the U.S. He was in uh, the military during World War II. Uh, and just a, a lot of fascinating things about him and, and his life. Yeah, I think um, I, I'm sure a lot of our listeners can really kind of connect with this because uh, uh, those of us that had grandparents and we actually had time, precious time that we spent with them is so important. And of course, the stories that they bring back to life, sometimes on a repeated basis, you know, the, the stories from their past, uh, home countries, and of course, the Great Recession, which uh, Great Depression, which was um, just historical in proportions that we can't even comprehend. So what was kind of that one or two life lessons that you took away from him and you say, you know, I want that to be part of my character? I, I, just the value of hard work. I think that there were so many stories that they would tell or he would tell and, you know, my grandmother as well. It, but uh, around, you know, what it was like to grow up during the Great Depression and, and, and like how hard that was. Um, and I mean, stories about making their clothing out of leftover sacks, you know, the flour sacks that they had bought their food and just, I mean, so many things are just completely different from, you know, how I grew up and, um, and from, you know, many of our lives today, uh, and just, you know, the value of hard work and, you know, how he worked himself through college and the things he needed to do in order to do that. And, uh, you know, his first job was really working in the family business, which was a, a stone cutting and sort of like monument making business, a lot of work with granite and other stuff. Um, and just like the, 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 the physical side of like what a, what a lot of those jobs were like. Uh, so I think a lot of it is just, I took away uh, just like the value of hard work and sort of persistence. Yeah. So speaking of work, work ethics, which brings me to kind of the, the core uh, aspect of your work, work career is, was really at HubSpot and it was, it was a really kind of a transformative period for you in terms of your personal, but also your professional growth. How would you characterize your journey from the early founding days to eventually going IPO? I think, yeah, I think a lot of people um, have kind of one experience in their career that really kind of gives them an opportunity and, and an opportunity to prove themselves and combine that with a little luck and uh, it kind of helps propel you. And that was definitely that experience for me. I, you know, I worked in finance and worked at a couple of startups and, um, had an opportunity to work at another software company, uh, but the chance to join HubSpot as part of the early founding team, the first you know four people, um, was a tremendous opportunity. And um, obviously, you know, from there, I was there for almost nine years. Uh, we grew it to a couple hundred million in revenue. We went public, and a lot of things changed over the time there. I think the one thing that really stands out to me was as we grew from four people to you know fifteen hundred employees. Um, I had to constantly reinvent myself as a leader. And so I ran the marketing team there the whole time, but running the marketing team when it's just you is very different than when it's 10 people, then 30 people, then 40 people and becomes global, then you know 70 or 80 or 120 people. And uh, one of the things I really focused on uh, and had to push myself to do was just continuously reinvent my leadership style, how I thought about running the team, uh, the actual like process and systems we use to run the team, things like that. And I think that, you know, technically I had the same title there for nine years, but I felt like my job was completely different every, you know, 18 months or so. Yeah, that's a really kind of incis insightful point that you're making, which is that oftentimes 
the founders who start a venture are not necessarily the type that actually stewards it all the way to public and then and perpetually thereafter. Um, so the fact that you actually were able to evolve and morph yourself and you remain not only relevant but effective says a lot about your ability to adapt. Um, is there kind of a insight around the leadership skills that people need to think about? Because I think sometimes we kind of have a natural tendency or some comfort areas where we lean towards, but what are some areas that you felt like you, know, you have to be honest with yourself and say, you know, I need to do some internal inventory stock and have to kind of recalibrate this, this aspect. Yeah. I, um, early on, I think a lot of my leadership style, I had managed small teams before, which I think you can do in a much more personal way. You can build personal relationships with the people on your team and, uh, and the way you manage you know, a team of five, 10, 15 people is you can know them all in a very detailed way, especially professionally, and, and use that as one of the ways that you manage them and work with them and, and help point them in the right direction. As the team started to scale beyond that, uh, an area of skills that I had to really develop was how to think about managing and leading an organization where you don't have that close relationship with everyone. And certainly when the team got to be even 100 plus people, I, didn't, I knew everyone's name, but I didn't know exactly who everyone worked for and exactly what they did in their day-to-day -day job. And you know, we were growing so fast, a lot of the people were brand new, and I, I sort of barely knew them. And the idea of standing up in front of a team-wide meeting and giving a presentation that's going to inspire and align that team is a very, very different proposition than trying to inspire and align you know, a dozen people that you know really well and that you've built a ton of trust with. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that whole area where, where there were a bunch of skills there around presenting to larger groups, um, you know, inspiring people that didn't necessarily know you very well, how to sort of um, build trust and relationships with people that you're not meeting with on a one-to-one -one basis. There's a whole bunch of skills that I had to really work on and develop over time. And one of the things I did um, was I actually formed like a peer group of other CMOs and I tried to find CMOs that were leading larger marketing teams than I had at the time. Um, and I was fortunate because I was doing a lot of this sort of newer, digital, more inbound marketing that they all wanted to learn about. And so there's kind of a good almost peer mentoring there that I was teaching them about the newer types of marketing, but they were teaching me about how to run a much larger team. Uh, and so a combination of reading a lot of books and just um, asking a lot of peers and trying to find some mentors that could teach me about those things uh, was super helpful. Uh, but I think the most important insight is just as you're growing and developing your career, think about the job, like how your job is going to change over the next 12 to 18 months and just constantly try to prepare yourself for that. I think most of the times when people fail um, at doing that, it's mostly because they didn't see the changes coming, uh, not that they weren't able to prepare themselves for them. Great insight. Fantastic. So let's talk about Lola.com. Uh, you were specifically tapped or recruited by Paul English, the founder of Kayak, who uh, has invested in over 40 startups. Uh, he felt that you were one of the top marketers, especially in the, I think the Boston region. Tell us about Lola.com. How is it using machine learning and providing 24 seven support to business travelers in a way that is different from offline, but also some of the online uh, platforms that are out there? Yeah, so what we've done here at Lola.com is we do corporate travel. So we sell to businesses and then the employees within that business use us to manage all their travel. Uh, and that gives the business and the finance team control and visibility over all the travel spend. It gives uh, the business an opportunity to have their employees uh, and uh, save time and also for the business to save money. And then we have a much better experience for the people that are on the road because we have 24 seven service um, assisted with some AI, some AI, but heavily led by the humans. Uh, and so there's a ton of value there. And so if you have kind of a, a mid-sized mid-market business, you're probably still using consumer sites for your employees to, to book and manage their travel. Uh, and there's a ton of advantages to having that centralized uh, that we just talked about. And so that's the market that we're in and we're going after. And I think the, the things that we're sort of much more effective at versus the traditional solutions are, you can get your whole company up and running in about 30 minutes. Uh, it's super fast and easy to implement. Uh, the product is very lightweight, really easy to use. Uh, and we have amazing service. And all that means that we have actually the best reviews in our industry. Like if you look on Captera and the, and these other sites that do reviews of B2B services, I think on Captera we have more than 60 reviews and they're all five-star reviews. So our customers really love it because we've invested so much in the product and the customer experience. And most of that comes from uh, Paul and his vision. So Paul Inch is the co-founder of Kayak, a really popular consumer travel website. 
and he took all the insights and actually the head designer that he worked with to design all of Kayak is here as well. And so we, we took really that DNA from building that awesome consumer site uh, based on travel and have now applied that to the B2B world. Uh, and so it's been awesome to work alongside him uh, and see the team just have such a great product. Um, I'd say the other, the other piece of it that's been exciting is that Paul, I think, you know, he started as both the CEO and the founder of the business. And then as the company started to grow and focus more on the B2B side, um, he asked me to join, which I think shows that he has a ton of uh, humility and just self-awareness about what things he's good at. And I think he's among the best in the world at product and engineering and building just a beautiful, easy to use, streamlined product. But I think he knew that building out a sales organization and marketing and go to market, especially the B2B world, he didn't know as much about and he needed some help with. Um, and luckily he and I had known each other for a number of years. We'd co-invested as angel investors in a few different startups. And so um, when the opportunity came about to potentially work with him, I was super excited about it. That's, that's terrific. Um, going back to Kayak and, 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 and Paul's experience is that uh, he knew that um, it was about disintermediation. So the traditional kind of the travel and booking into more direct self-directed model. Here, because you're, uh, you're tackling the B2B, was making sure that there was a white glove concierge service component so that the human relationship was still a dominant play or core competency in addition to the ease of the user experience online as well. Um, how do you guys rationalize a service in the context of cost structure? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. I think that, um, <clears throat> so today if you're a business, you can hire an old school travel agency, which is really expensive. Typically, if you call them to you know, book a flight or do something, they're gonna charge you 20 to $50. Um, but they have kind of that white glove service. Or the other alternative is you can use you know, consumer sites like Kayak and do it yourself, but then you have no support at all. And I think what we've done at Lola is try to build a super streamlined, really easy, you know, Kayak or better for B2B um, self-serve portion of the product and software. So we have a mobile app, a, a website, where you can do and manage most of it yourself. But for those times when you need help, you maybe are gonna miss a connection on one of your flights, or there's something more complex that's happening, or some last minute thing that happens, and you're in an Uber on the way to the airport, and you need to change something, we have agents available. And what I think is great is most people today prefer not to call someone on the phone and sort of you know, wait while they're doing things, but to be able to text someone. And so over 90% of our support ends up coming in via text and chat, uh, which is great because our agents can be super responsive, but it's also less of a time burden for the person that needs the support. So we tried to create really that happy medium. And what that allows us is actually have a lower support cost structure than the traditional travel agencies. So we have a cost advantage over them but still have great phenomenal service. And because we have a B2B solution, we can charge more. So there's an annual subscription fee, unlike using Kayak. So we're sort of that great kind of middle ground if you don't want the traditional old school agency that's really kind of um, heavyweight, you know, not very, not good self-service tools and really expensive, but you need more than what the consumer websites are offering you. And so that's really, kind of the, the niche that we have. So certainly we invest far more in service than like a kayak does, but we can do it much more cost effectively than a traditional agency, but still give people, uh, you know, the phenomenal level of support that they need. So how do you rationalize uh, external pressure, whether it's coming from the industry or even from institutional investors that are saying, why don't you make more use of chatbots and essentially small bits and pieces of narrow AI to actually handle a lot of the kind of the tier one, tier two, so that you're not having to grow and, and pay for this expensive call center. Yeah, I think that's that's a good point. And I think there's sort of a, um, there can be some pressure there. Uh, the way we think about it is we always come back to the customer experience. And so we do a lot of work, um, you know, a huge number of our chats, we get feedback from the customer on what their satisfaction level is. And we have a bunch of basically customer service and customer satisfaction benchmarks that we track. And so as we're layering in sort of more efficiencies into the system, we're making sure that none of those drop. Um, and so I think you can have, you know, if, if cost and lowering costs is your number one goal, then you're probably gonna let the customer experience uh, slide in order to hit that cost goal. We think about it the other way around. The number one thing we need to do is have phenomenally happy customers that are referring other companies to buy from us and to use our service. 
um, and to keep customers for the long term. And so as long as we're focused on the customer experience as the number one goal, then I think it's going to put us in the right place. And we probably won't, won't achieve the uh, as much cost savings versus maybe some other companies. But for us, it's, mo it's so important to have the customer experience be the number one goal that we're focused on. So, so what's really interesting for me as I'm listening is that if um, Lola.com had, let's say, recruited a CFO into the CEO position, that person's perspective on things would be very different. But the fact that you come from a CMO background, you're really passionate about the experience. And it's a very different kind of tone and focus. And, and I, I definitely see it. And I, I could see why you guys are consistently getting five-star reviews and, uh, and feedback from your, your business enterprise claims. You, one of the things you mentioned is the difference between data-informed versus data-driven. What does that mean and which is more important? You know, I think that um, many times you can be, if you're data-driven, that means every little decision you're making is purely based on data and you're not allowing other types of intuition or insight to kind of creep in and influence those decisions. And I think sometimes if you're really just trying to optimize something at the margin, like you're in the right sort of general vicinity and you're just trying to like eke a little bit more productivity out of something, then being data-driven is okay. I think here, because we're sort of inventing a new category um, and we have a lot of intuitive insights from just our conversations with customers that, you know, it's hard to put a 20 minute interview with a customer into like a set of data. Um, you know, we may have numbers that indicate like, oh, well, we should build this feature next or that feature isn't very important, but perhaps a combination of our intuition, some imagining of how the world could be that maybe might create a sort of a new vision of where the product needs to go. And just this intuitive sense of having talked to a lot of customers of what they're really looking for, even though it might not be showing up in some survey, um, I think pushes us to really say that like there's times when uh, a survey or sort of other data, product usage data or something like that might indicate that the product roadmap should go in a certain direction. But there's times when we're going to sort of ignore that and say, you know what, we just really feel strongly that we know the customer well, we understand the problems we're trying to solve. And while the data says we should solve it this way, we're actually going to solve it in some brand new, um, uh, more kind of transformative way and, you know, and then launch that and then sort of see how that works. So uh, Paul is especially really big on this. I think that you know, he um, he wouldn't have built Kayak the way it was if he just asked a bunch of customers, like, what do you want it to look like? What do you want, you know, Flight Search to look like? Um, and so I think there's a, there's a big bias here toward, uh, again, using data to inform uh, our view of the world, but not letting it drive every little decision. Mm -hmm. All right. That's, this is so important. I think most product development teams don't quite get that. It's a subtlety, but it's a very important distinction that makes a difference between market fit versus just delivering something that's um, already pre-existing. And I think especially in the early days, it's important to sort of be more data informed than data driven. I, I think at this point, Facebook can kind of tune their whole interface being very data driven. But I think in the early days, it's important when you're inventing a new product to really be much more just data informed. I agree, I absolutely agree with that. So the one question we always ask our guests is, what was your greatest product innovation failure and what was the lesson learned? <laughs> Boy. Um, there's a bunch. Um, gosh, I would point to um, probably a couple things. Probably a couple things at HubSpot, and I'll point to one thing in particular, which is um, there was a feature. Uh, this is way back in the first few years of the business. As we we're building out, so HubSpot is marketing software for small, medium-sized businesses. And we were slowly building out this full platform. And so we had a, a, a website builder like content management, a landing page builder, some analytics, some SEO tools. And we started to build out basically um, email and sort of marketing automation and lead nurturing tools. And we probably, I know, we launched them too early. And the first version we launched, I think we were just so focused on growth and building out the whole platform. We were hearing from customers that these were important. Um, you know, we were trying to grow our wallet share and we, we launched it and it was, it was the first version of that product was a low quality product. Mm. Um, it would, it didn't support large, you know, larger email lists, anything over like a few thousand. It would take like two days for the email to get sent out. So it wasn't very scalable. There were a lot of little bugs. There were a bunch of features that were missing. And I think we really rushed that to market and we, um, 
we took some flack from, from the customers because we had sort of been telling them these features were coming and you know, then we sort of you know, claimed victory and said like, oh, well, we've launched these things, aren't they great? And then they started clicking around and using them and they're like, actually, they're not that great. Um, and that's one where I think that you need to run that balance. I think the learning there is um, it's, it's great to sort of build things quickly and kind of ship things and iterate, but be careful how you do that. Maybe you need to ship something to a smaller group of customers just in beta, or maybe you need to test things and sort of just understand that um, uh, the first version of a product is never going to be perfect. But there is a bar there, and if you ship something that's of too low quality, you'll lose some credibility with customers, and it might be better worth waiting, doing more of an investment and taking a little bit more time to launch something that's better. Um, and so that's, that's one lesson I think we learned over time. Yeah, I think that's a really timely and prudent advice because so many of the, especially the younger entrepreneurs that's coming into the scene is that they've kind of been given this propaganda that fast fail, even if it's meant pushing out something, some MVP that's really not ready. And yeah. you're, you're sharing uh, quite a bit of wisdom uh, from real. I think that's right. Well, I think, it, again, it's MVP can be, it's, you know, minimum viable product. And what that really means is probably narrow the focus, but for the thing you're launching, make it really deep and like very functional. Um, it's not, you know, something that's really um, barely has any functionality, but covers a wide area. So I think there's a, there's a difference in terms of how you think about that MVP. If you think about it in the right way, that's a useful metaphor, but it can be applied in the wrong way. Perfect. Great. So on that note, I've been joined by Mike Volpe, CEO of Lola.com. Mike, thanks for joining. Thanks a ton for having me.